Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, parents, uh, patients, parents, caregivers, and uh, clinicians um, with interest in autoimmune encephalitis um, worldwide. My name is Daria Muir. I'm the vice president of autoimmune, uh, International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society. And I'm here today with Dr. Sergio Muniz Castrillo to uh, speak about an, a very hot topic in the long-term care of patients with autoimmune encephalitis, which is the prognostic, uh, prognostic indicators for functional and cognitive outcomes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Unis Castrillo very much for his um, Ability and availability to be with us to get, uh, today and to uh, help us address and understand this topic. And um, I will introduce him in just a few words as he's a neurologist um, specialized in autoimmune encephalitis and paraneoplastic neurological syndromes. He is currently at um, a postdoctoral um, at Stanford University. He received his doctorate from Universidad de Oviedo in Spain and studied neurology at Hospital Clinico San Carlos in Madrid, Spain, and earned his PhD in neuroscience at Université Claude Bernard Lyon in France. He's uh, mostly interested in um, uh, the association between um, autoimmune encephalitis and uh, human leukocyte uh, antigen, particularly defining different patterns uh, according to phenotype and immunological features. He's uh, further interested in investigating the immunogenetics characteristic of these disorders from genetic predispositions to the immunological pathways leading to immune tolerance breakdown. And he's here today again to um, help us discuss the prognostic indicators for functional and cognitive outcomes. So Dr. Sergio Muniz Castillo, you have the mic. Um, well, thank you so much, Daria, for, for the, the introduction and the invitation. And thanks also to Tabita and uh, everybody at the International Immune Societies uh, Society. And as uh, you were saying, uh, I will uh, talk Quite briefly, actually, on um, uh, prognosis and uh, functional cognitive outcomes in uh, autoimmune encephalitis. Oops. Yeah. Well, as um, all of you know, um, there are a bunch of symptoms um, uh, very common in autoimmune encephalitis, uh, such as cognitive uh, dysfunction, psychiatric symptoms epilepsy, movement disorders, sleep disturbances, or speech or language uh, problems that may actually also evolve into uh, permanent or long-term uh, deficits. However, uh, most of the studies uh, addressing uh, prognosis in autoimmune encephalitis usually um, use usually use uh, the modified ranking scale, the MRS, uh, to uh, measure disability. And um, maybe you know, but uh, the MRS was actually uh, developed uh, for uh, patients with a stroke and uh, therefore uh, it really um, considers the ability of the patients to walk independently and their uh, motor um, disability, which uh, we know that it's not like the main feature or the main symptom or sequela in uh, autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, um, consequently, um, there was this attempt by the uh, South Korean uh, group um, to develop a, a specific uh, clinical assessment scale in autoimmune encephalitis, the case uh, score, uh, which um, um, included uh, several items. Uh, as you can see here in the table, like the presence of seizures, memory dysfunction, psychiatric symptoms, consciousness, language problems, uh, dyskinesia dystonia, so movement disorders, gait instability or uh, ataxia, brainstem dysfunction, and weakness. So uh, an array of symptoms and um, clinical features more um, closely uh, related to what we see in autoimmune encephalitis. It is uh, noteworthy, however, that this um, case score was developed in a rather diverse cohort 
uh, including some very well-defined uh, types of autoimmunencephalitis, such as anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis or anti-LJ1 encephalitis, but also other disorders that might not be so closely related uh, from a physiopathological point of view uh, to autoimmune encephalitis, such as ADEM, or some cases with no autoantibodies, which is uh, sometimes problematic. So the case score um, uh, has these uh, items, and for each item, there are certain levels that receive different uh, scores. And um, the total score, uh, the maximum total score is 27. And as you can see, there was a good correlation between the case score and the uh, MRS. However, as I was saying, um, this score was developed using different diseases. And uh, when we uh, talk about autoimmune encephalitis, we are not talking about a single disease. We are talking about different diseases that may have different outcomes. And especially we uh, consider the two uh, most common types of autoimmune encephalitis, we already um, see that uh, their demographic uh, profiles are very different. And the NMDA encephalitis, it's most uh, commonly seen, observed in uh, young women, uh, whereas anti-LJ1 encephalitis usually develops in uh, elderly men. So um, it's uh, important, uh, therefore, to study outcomes specifically in each type of autoimmune encephalitis. And I will be um, treating a little bit more in detail these two because, as I said, they are uh, the most common ones and the ones uh, for which we have uh, the largest uh, evidence. Well, as you know, anti uh, receptor encephalitis usually have, uh, patients usually have a first uh, phase with uh, prominent psychiatric symptoms, also uh, sleep disturbances, movement disorders that um, usually worsen progressively uh, into a severe uh, uh, clinical picture with uh, central hypoventilation, dysautonomia. Uh, many of them uh, require uh, ICU admission. And then uh, with the appropriate treatment, most patients improve, although the improvement usually uh, takes uh, several months or even uh, years. And um, if we take into account um, the MRS and case scores, we can see that, uh, for instance, in this very recently published uh, study, um, the MRS and the case score improve, both of them, with um, the follow-up. But despite this improvement, only one third of the patients are able to uh, return to the, uh, their uh, previous functional status. So uh, the MRS and the case score uh, don't seem to really uh, assess um, properly the disability in anti-NMDA anti uh, receptor encephalitis. And uh, why? Because uh, probably they are not assessing cognitive dysfunction or anxiety or depression that are also very important for uh, the disability or the quality of life of the patients. And uh, this was also uh, observed in this other study from uh, the group of Karsten Finke in Berlin, in which, as you can see uh, here, despite an improvement of the MRS, uh, during the follow-up, uh, the um, degree of uh, disability due to uh, cognitive dysfunction was much greater uh, than when we just analyzed the MRS. So again, the MRS is not sufficient, it's not enough, it's not a good tool to uh, assess cognitive dysfunction and cognitive sequela in uh, autoimmune encephalitis and more specifically in uh, anti-NMDA uh, receptor encephalitis. And similarly, in this very nicely uh, conducted study uh, from the uh, group of Barcelona, from uh, Professor uh, Josep Dalmau, in which they uh, follow prospectively um, uh, patients with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, and surprisingly, they uh, found that the uh, cognitive uh, dysfunction that these patients uh, presented really resembled those um, or that of a patient with uh, schizophrenia, although 
in contrast to uh, those with schizophrenia, of course, patients with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis improved. And uh, with the follow-up, their uh, values or the, the different uh, measurement of their cognitive dysfunction really uh, got close to that of the healthy uh, subjects. Although uh, even after two years, they didn't reach uh, normal values. So it's uh, an improvement that occurs, but it's a, a slow improvement. So what are the prognostic factors? Which um, factors can have an impact on the prognosis of um, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis? Well, uh, the first one that everybody will uh, think of, it would be a treatment, right? So in this um, already classic study um, led by uh, Martin Titulaer, uh, we can see that patients that are uh, responders for uh, first-line treatment, uh, which are uh, usually considered as um, IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulins, plasmapheresis, or corticosteroids, have um, or show a um, faster improvement and a better progno prognosis. Similarly, those patients that do not respond to first-line treatment but respond to second-line treatment have also uh, a better prognosis. And other predictors of good outcome in this study were early treatment within four weeks after clinical onset and no ICU admission, which is um, quite obvious. And uh, what about relapses? Relapses in anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, uh, well, depending on the study, it's about 12-15%, uh, usually are less severe than the initial episode, but uh, they can, of course, add more disability. And uh, again, in this study from uh, Martin Titulaer, uh, patients that don't uh, have uh, tumors have um, a lesser uh, risk um, sorry, a greater risk to develop uh, relapses and patients that are treated with a first or even second line treatment are uh, less prompt to uh, develop uh, relapses. And this was also observed in a, a more uh, recent study from the German group in which uh, rituximab, which is the main second line treatment used in general in autoimmune encephalitis, but also in NMDA receptor encephalitis, um, was useful to prevent uh, relapses and also to improve prognosis um, measured this time by the MRS, although as you can see um, on the um, graph, uh, patients started to uh, improve even before the administration of rituximab, likely due to the uh, first-line treatment. Um, more studies assessing other um, prognosis factors. Um, here, uh, predictors of good outcome were um, teenagers and uh, patients that received first-line treatment, uh, whereas uh, patients, uh, very young patients or early, elderly patients or patients that require ICU admission again, the extreme delta brush, that is a very particular pattern on the EEG, or patients that didn't receive early immunotherapy uh, had a poor outcome. And again, uh, rituximab, uh, the administration of rituximab was associated with um, fewer uh, relapses. So uh, talking about the extreme delta brush, uh, this has been observed to be uh, associated with a poor outcome in several studies, also an abnormal posterior rhythm in the uh, EEG, um, other um, neuroimaging biomarkers, such as uh, the development of cerebellar atrophy or hippocampal atrophy, and also several cytokines and other soluble uh, biomarkers. Um, but what about the antibodies? Because actually, as we know, uh, these uh, the antibodies are the responsible for the clinical picture of anti-NMDA anti -NMDA receptor encephalitis. And about the potential role as uh, prognostic uh, factors um, of the antibodies, there are uh, two studies that I would like to um, show you. The first one um, is this one from, uh, again, the group of Barcelona in Spain. And here um, uh, they show that the CSF uh, titers of the antibodies correlate better 
with the prognosis than uh, serum titers. And also uh, not only for the prognosis, but also for the relapses. Um, so um, CSF antibodies uh, in this study correlated better with prognosis and with uh, relapses than um, serum antibodies and also uh, patients that um, had a better outcome usually show a um, faster decrease uh, of the antibody titers in the CSF. Similarly, in this study that we uh, performed in Lyon, France, uh, we investigated um, the prognostic uh, value of persistent CSF antibodies at uh, one year after a clinical onset. And um, we found again that uh, those patients with persistent CSF antibodies one year later um, had poorer outcome and also uh, usually had uh, more relapses. So um, I want to highlight, however, that uh, despite these two studies um, suggesting that um, CSF antibody titers could be worth it or, or could be useful to determine prognosis. Uh, we know also that many patients uh, may have a very good uh, recovery, a very good um, evolution and have still uh, antibodies in the CSF, positive antibodies in the CSF. So the, the value of um, these uh, persistent uh, CSF antibodies has to be yet um, to be defined, has to be uh, yet to be um, determined more precisely. And um, well, uh, another point or another um, aspect that I would like to show you uh, regarding anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis was actually uh, the development of this uh, score, a specific score to predict one-year functional status, uh, which actually uh, included some of the factors that we already mentioned, such as uh, ICU admission, no clinical improvement after uh, four weeks of treatment or early treatment during the first uh, four weeks, an abnormal MRI or an inflammatory CSF. And this uh, new score um, correlated very well with MRS, and uh, it has been also validated in uh, children uh, with some uh, modifications. So this uh, score could be uh, quite useful, uh, and maybe um, for the future, we could actually um, try to um, determine if uh, adding the uh, persistence of CSF antibodies would uh, add some value to, to the NEOS score. Uh, we will talk now about the second um, type of autoimmune encephalitis that I would like to, uh, to talk about is anti-LGA1 encephalitis. Um, as uh, you know, many patients, um, uh, for many patients, their uh, uh, clinical onset is characterized by these uh, fasciobrachial dystonic seizures that are patognomonic, are very extremely specific of uh, this disease. And progressively, these patients uh, develop other types of uh, seizures. And most importantly, in like in a second phase, they develop a cognitive dysfunction that is usually the main uh, sequela, the main deficit for these patients. Um, however, um, um, not only uh, cognition is uh, important in anti-LJ1 encephalitis, and in this uh, very nicely conducted study by uh, Sophie Bings uh, from Oxford, uh, they uh, actually reported that fatigue correlates very well with disability, cognition, depression, anxiety, and quality of life. And, um, and it happened uh, with uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis, very few uh, patients are able to uh, return to their premorbid uh, role. So there is something that we can definitely improve in terms of uh, treatment. Well, as I said, um, cognitive deficits are very common in anti-LGI1 encephalitis. Uh, and as you can see in this um, study from uh, the group of Martin Titulaire, almost 80% of the patient uh, have some type of cognitive uh, sequela. 
And there are many uh, factors that have been associated with poor uh, cognitive outcome, uh, such as low premotor cognitive reserve, um, an abnormal MRI, uh, an abnormal initial MRI, the development of uh, hypo hypocampal atrophy, no response to first line treatment, need of second line treatment, delay of immunotherapy, and the development of clinical relapses. Um, the development of chronic epilepsy is not that common in anti lg one encephalitis, uh, so most of the patients uh, will be seizure-free um, during the follow-up, but some factors associated with chronic epilepsy are female sex, younger age, late immunotherapy, and uh, very importantly, the development of uh, hypocampal atrophy on MRI. The value of uh, MRI on uh, anti-LJ1 encephalitis has been explored uh, several times, uh, and it has been associated, as I said, with both poor uh, cognitive outcome and also uh, chronic epilepsy, and uh, it includes both uh, the initial uh, MRI, uh, usually uh, hyperintensities in, um, involving both uh, mesiotemporal lobes, but also the development of hypocampal atrophy. Other uh, factors associated with uh, poor outcome are, uh, for instance, um, the um, titers of antibodies in uh, the serum that correlated with poor cognitive outcome, but also it has been uh, shown that um, high antibody titers in uh, the CSF correlated with poor cognitive outcome. There is some um, contradictory results regarding the um, subclass of IgG. As you may know, uh, anti-LGI1 encephalitis is um, mostly characterized by uh, IgG4 antibodies, especially in the CSF, although most patients have also IgG1 antibodies, particularly in the serum. And um, the predominance or higher titers of IgG1 antibodies in the serum was associated with poor cognitive outcome in uh, one study. And this could make sense uh, since IgG1 antibodies are able to activate, complement, and provoke more, uh, let's say, um, permanent neuronal damage compared to IgG4 antibodies. Um, well, um, we also observe that uh, higher titers of uh, antibodies are associated with uh, poorer outcome in this study that we performed in Lyon. Uh, and patients uh, with uh, CSF positive for antibodies had a poorer outcome, whereas patients that have a CSF uh, negative for the antibodies, which we don't actually think that is truly negative, uh, we do think that it's just uh, that titers are too low to be um, detected with uh, our uh, measurement uh, techniques, these patients with CSF negative usually had a better outcome. Other factors are associated with um, poor outcome in this study were age and uh, female sex, as well as uh, the presence of uh, cognitive uh, disorders, which is, as I said, the main uh, deficit in these patients. Very interestingly and very important actually is that early treatment in uh, patients uh, with uh, fasciobrachial dystonic seizures before the development of cognitive uh, disorders and particularly with uh, corticosteroids can prevent the development of cognitive sequela. So these uh, patients with anti-LJ1 encephalitis that um, are presenting exclusively with uh, fasciobrachial dystonic seizures really need to be treated with uh, corticosteroids in order to prevent the development of uh, cognitive sequela. And what about second line treatment in anti-LJ1 encephalitis? Well, uh, very close um, or very similar results to uh, those of anti-NMDA anti -NMDA receptor encephalitis. So rituximab in this um, um, German study also prevented relapses and also uh, improved um, uh, outcomes uh, measured by MRS, although uh, was less uh, significant than in uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis. And uh, regarding uh, relapses, 
Uh, again, more or less 14% of uh, patients will develop relapses in anti lga one encephalitis. They are usually milder than the initial episode, but they uh, provoke uh, additional disability. And in this study that we conducted in Lyon and has been very recently accepted uh, for publication, uh, we found that patients that have a cognitive dysfunction after the initial episode are more prompt to develop relapses. And also patients that were not treated with corticosteroids during the first episode are more prompt to develop uh, relapses. So uh, this again uh, really uh, suggest that or really reinforce the role of corticosteroids as first-line treatment in anti lgi one encephalitis. So just uh, some conclusions. Um, the long-term, especially cognitive outcomes, are still poorly investigated in autoimmune encephalitis, even in those uh, that are most common, such as anti-NMDR receptor and anti lgi one encephalitis. We have been using and we are still using inappropriate disability scales, mostly the MRS, that underestimate uh, cognitive deficits. And um, uh, for these two uh, types of autoimmune encephalitis, there is um, already um, enough evidence that early treatment associates with good uh, prognosis and uh, prevent uh, relapses. Probably also uh, the administration of second line treatment uh, with rituximab, still a substantial proportion of patients do not uh, achieve their premorbid status, and especially those that are uh, young and they can uh, still study or work, they are most or many of them, they are unable to do so. So uh, we really need to um, make some progress on the, the treatment and how we uh, assess prognosis in these patients. And regarding the um, um, identification of neuroimaging uh, prognosis factors or the role of uh, persistent or uh, positivity of uh, antibodies uh, in the CSF or in the serum, there is still some work to do to better define the role of, of, of those uh, biomarkers. And uh, that's it. I think that was... Uh, all that I wanted to discuss, um, and I'm of course uh, available for um, any question that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Muniz Castillo. Of course, there are questions, <laughs> quite a few. <laughs> and some of them come from, from patients, some of them come to clinicians who need okay. to kind of translate, transform, and integrate the, the all the clinical um, research uh, into, into daily practice. And um, one of them is, uh, when does cognitive impairment become chronic? Like when can we say that um, a patient with autoimmune encephalitis has passed a kind of acute phases and has acquired long-term or chronic um, cognitive and functional impairment? Well, um, I don't think there is like a single answer to that question. Uh, for instance, we know that um, patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis, um, as I showed, um, in um, the study conducted by uh, Mark Wasp in Barcelona, they can uh, still improve even two years after um, the, the, the onset. Um, so I don't think there is like a single answer to that question, uh, but they can definitely improve long after uh, the onset. That doesn't mean that the disease is active in the sense that they do need more immunotherapy, uh, but uh, probably they really need more uh, rehabilitation or other types of um, treatments more uh, oriented to uh, yeah to to improve their cognition or their uh, also as I said uh, like uh, anxiety or depression are very important and have uh, uh, a 
important impact on the quality of life of these patients. So the, the short answer, but it's not completely um, true, I would say that it can be quite long and um, we have to, uh, there is no like a fixed uh, threshold, a, fi a fixed um, period of time and each patient is different. And of course, it's not the same. A young patient with an MDR receptor encephalitis or a, an old patient with NMDA receptor encephalitis or with anti-LJ1 encephalitis. Probably NMDA receptor encephalitis or a young patient with NMDA receptor encephalitis has much more cognitive reserve and has much more uh, chances of uh, improvement or of long-term improvement. Whereas a patient with anti-LJ1 encephalitis in their 70s or in their 80s uh, is more prompt to improve very close to the onset, but then uh, later or uh, yeah, later um, improvements are less likely, I would say. Are there any connections between the length of treatment and the cognitive and functional outcomes? And I want to kind of detail a little bit on this. We've seen patients treated for kind of a few weeks or short courses of, of, uh, of first-line therapy, and then they are told that they are cured, and then they have relapses. Yeah. And they get another few weeks of treatment, and they don't improve that well. And we've seen also patients who receive years of immunosuppressant therapy, sometimes first line, sometimes second line. Um, and some of them also struggle for long term. So do you know to be uh, any research or any connection between um, length of treatment or at least the minimum length of treatment and the prognostic of, of cognitive and functional outcome? Um, well, I think, again, um, each treatment has to be uh, individualized, um, of course. Um, I would say that the more aggressive we are at the beginning, the better, for sure. Um, so I wouldn't say that length of treatment is that important, but to uh, prescribe or to give the appropriate treatment at the beginning, not to be uh, too careful or not to be uh, too afraid of um for instance, given a second line immunotherapy, if we, we really think that uh, with the first line uh, um, treatment, we are not getting uh, the improvement that we should um, observe. So I, I would say that, yeah, like being a little bit aggressive at the beginning, I, I would say it's actually um, more important than prolonged treatment, you know? Uh, like for instance, if I don't think it's really worth it or useful, uh, in a patient that don't um, really improve with first line treatment, like to keep on uh, prescribing uh, uh, cycles of uh, IVIG, I think you should move on to second line as soon as you see or you consider that the patient is not going well or not going well enough because sometimes it's well enough. Um, and then uh, the use of, for instance, rituximab as a uh, maintained therapy, I mean, I've done it many times and uh, I know many colleagues that um, I do it and I think it has its role, but of course it's again, each patient is different. There are some, uh, I think there is one study or maybe two uh, in which um, the length of a corticosteroid uh, therapy in anti-LJ1 encephalitis was associated with um, um, cognitive outcomes. I'm not sure if it was cognitive outcomes or like a general outcome measured by the MRS. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, I don't have like a fixed uh, length of treatment that is oh, like six months is associ associated with good outcome or three months is associated with, with uh, good outcome. I think it, 
I would say it's more important to be really, I mean, really aggressive. Maybe it's too much to say, but like not to be too afraid of of um, giving second line at, at the first episode. And of course, following very closely uh, the patients to uh, see any fluctuation that may uh, suggest a relapse. And um, for patients that are treated, for instance, especially for anti-LGA1 encephalitis, uh, these patients usually, yes, um, they require not very long, but longer um, treatments with uh, corticosteroids because um, fasciobrachial dystonic seizures, for instance, are very sensitive to them. And if, um, or even more general clinical relapses, if corticosteroids are uh, suppressed uh, too uh, fast, uh, patients develop, um, yeah, I mean, they worsen. So um, yeah, most most importantly is to, to be sure that we treat correctly uh, the first episode. Do, how long or for how long should cognition be measured in Ooh. patients? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I think that these patients should be always like, um, I mean, of course, if it's been, I don't know, two, three years or even four years and uh, the patient is stable, um, with no medication, maybe they don't need like a very close follow up, but I don't think one year visit hurts, you know. Uh, so um, at least um, I would say uh, once a year uh, for some years. Um, probably the first two years much more frequent. Every three, four, even six months maximum, I would say. But um, I don't think autoimmune encephalitis patients um, don't deserve to be followed like for many years, especially considering um, the risk of, of relapses or other complications or deficits that may require uh, like being uh, followed by a neurologist. So yeah, I think it doesn't hurt even if it's just a, a cognitive evaluation, not like a proper neuropsychological testing, but maybe just like a a, a quick test uh, performed by the neurologist, like a MOCA or uh, or Minimental, I think that doesn't hurt at least once a year. We we see patients and even even clinicians kind of uh, not differentiating very clearly between a flare and a relapse. And kind of the main thing that appears is cognitive uh, changes in the patient. I mean, I think that um, the main, I would say the main two difficulties with relapses are um, differentiate them from fluctuations due to changes in the treatment. This, I, in, at least in my experience, is particularly difficult in anti-LGI1 encephalitis. As I was saying before, when you are like um, uh, decreasing the dose of corticosteroids, these patients uh, can uh, very easily worsen, but, and it's not a true relapse. It's just that you are decreasing too fast the, the corticosteroids. And, um, and these fluctuations can also happen in other types of aluminosphalitis due to changes in treatment. And the second difficulty, I would say it's also, uh, in, uh, for instance, in anti-LGA1 encephalitis, these patients are, or some of them are rather uh, old and they may develop other uh, neurological issues. It's not that uncommon that a patient with anti-LGA1 encephalitis a few years later develops uh, Alzheimer disease or other types of um, neurodegenerative disease. So, um, and they have this um, deterioration of cognition and then, uh, then is uh, sometimes it's tough to differentiate it between a relapse of the anti-LG1 encephalitis and uh, for instance, uh, um, a clinical onset of an Alzheimer disease. 
So I would say that these two uh, are the, the, the two main difficulties uh, with relapses. And of course, um, well, treatment, I would say, um, since most of these relapses are usually milder uh, than the initial episode, maybe they do not require such aggressive treatments, but at the same time, you don't want to risk for another relapse. So uh, I think that's another difficulty and, and it has to be um, assessed for a, every patient uh, separately. In terms of um, ongoing psychiatric and behavioral symptoms, do you know of any research on these in patients recovering from uh, anti-NMDA or receptors encephalitis? Well, I know that um, Mark Wasp and Joseph Dalmau um, are still working on the long-term uh, evolution of anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, and they are not only assessing cognition, but also behavioral disorders. So, uh, but I'm not sure like what they are um investigating as far as I know it's like a continuation of their uh, Lancet uh, study uh, but of course uh, that would be very interesting because at least the one that they have published was very comprehensive uh, with a lot of data uh, a lot of uh, measurements and of course I think we will have um, very nice data uh, regarding also uh, behavioral disturbances. How about rehabilitation <laughs> that's another tough one uh, yeah the, they are all tough um i think at least in my experience um rehabilitation depends so much on where are you working uh and the resources that uh you have and i've seen the two extremes i would say a uh, place i've worked in places where there was no rehabilitation at all and patients uh, have to actually find themselves uh, where to go uh, because like the public health system didn't provide it. And I've seen the opposite, like very uh, well-organized um, structures um, with uh, good rehabilitation. I think in general in neurology, and now now. No, now I'm not talking even like a neuroimmunologist, like a neurologist, general neurologist, at least with my own experience, is that rehabilitation is probably like something that have not um, received the appropriate um, consideration by well, the people that actually decide <laughs> uh, the resources that we have. Um, and sometimes it's, it's even more important that, I don't know, like a fancy treatment or a fancy diagnostic uh, test. But uh, at least in my experience, like in, in talking, as I said, in neurology, uh, where, as you can imagine, rehabilitation is key uh, for stroke, for, I don't know, uh, uh, neuropathies, for uh, myopathies, for uh, spinal cord disorders. For everything, it's, uh, it's it's key, and my, I mean, unfortunately, my my experience is quite uh, disappointing. In which, like, uh, you are always fighting uh, to uh, get uh, your patient into rehabilitation, and once uh, the patient is into rehabilitation, you are have to fight to keep them <laughs> in rehabilitation because maybe like they say, oh no, just ten sessions, it's enough. No, come on, I mean. Because moreover, rehabilitation not only has, I think, a role um, to get patients to improve, but also as a maintain therapy, let's say. It's not like, oh, you improve, you don't need any, any rehabilitation uh, anymore. No, you still need it to actually maintain this, this uh, level of achievement, this level of improvement. So I, I really think that it's, very hard it's and it's uh, many times frustrating not only for a patient but also for a neurologist yeah i was i was just i was just thinking at my own experience as you know i'm a warrior with with uh, 
autoimmune encephalitis. And when I tell people, like I was diagnosed in a country and a few years later I moved countries and in the country where I was diagnosed, uh, which is Romania, I got sent to rehabilitation when I got out of, of the hospital and I went through rehabilitation, which was physical, neurological, occupational, um, speech, um, psychotherapy, a lot. Yeah. And it's been going on for 10 years. So it's an ongoing process that evolves and changes with me or with the patient. And then I moved countries and everybody was looking at me like, what, why? Why do you, why? Because you're cured. And like I'm, I'm, I still need help with. I still need this and this and this to help improve with my memory. With, and yeah. they were like, we don't do the things like this here. And then it's the patient who comes like, but why? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, as, um, like you were saying, it it's work with 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 what you have as a clinician and also as a patient to be curious enough to yeah. go further and beyond and also to kind of bring it all to a common name as we have in diagnostic criteria and treatment to include this because cognitive and functional outcomes are so important yeah. and occupy such a such a huge area of the life of patients and are uh, basically a, a, a social and economical burden because many patients cannot go back to work or to function as as they did before yeah. how about seronegative patients or antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis is there anything different or um, you know, I always say the same thing about seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. I don't think we can um, extract many conclusions about it uh, because as I, for instance, as I explained a little bit when I was talking about the case score and how it was developed, when we talk about seronegative autoimmune encephalitis, we are probably talking about several diseases. It's very likely not one single disease. And we have seen this for years that patients that were initially considered seronegative autoimmune encephalitis as um, research um, progressed and um, the discovery of new antibodies uh, happened. Some patients were uh, known to have, uh, I don't know, many years ago, LGA1, Casper2, Alera, DPPX. So I don't think we can really talk about um, seronegative autoimmune encephalitis as a whole, like a single disease. So I would be very careful um, about like saying, oh, seronegative patients evolve like this or do this type of treatment or um, this is a factor of prognosis in seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. Because yeah, as I, I'm saying, I don't think, I mean, everybody thinks that, that it's not one single disease. So um, the same way we cannot um, we cannot um, transfer all of our knowledge of an NMDA receptor encephalitis to anti-LGA1 or vice versa, because they are very different diseases. Uh, we cannot transfer knowledge between seronegative uh, autoimmune encephalitis that we actually haven't uh, defined properly. What are your thoughts on TMS as a potential treatment for ongoing sequelae from autoimmune encephalitis? TMS? Yeah. Uh, I have no experience with TMS, so um, I cannot tell. Um, if you see a marked improvement after IV steroids, that um, the improvement decreases when the steroids wear off. Is that likely still 
active autoimmune encephalitis or would that be cognitive decline from depression? So where do the actual, um, um, I would, I would, I'm trying to reinterpret this. Where would the, the um, where would you evaluate the, um, the um, depression and anxiety as a consequence of autoimmune encephalitis and the, the, the presentation of that compared to the actual cognitive uh, decline due to the presence of the antibodies in a patient? Uh, I'm not sure I'm following. So you mean when... Is it possible to say that depression and anxiety and uh, anxiety are like due to the cognitive dysfunction or uh, a cognitive dysfunction is actually due to depression and anxiety ah. or the cognitive dysfunction is due to still the presence of the and the fight of the antibodies? I mean, usually the cognitive dysfunction, if it if it uh, appears, it's present. Uh, from the beginning, uh, so uh, I think that's uh, like if you have like a good baseline evaluation, that's the most useful thing that uh, you can use as a as a um, reference. Um, and then the follow up also uh, will tell you if uh, a patient is uh, cognitively impaired and improves. And uh, then for some reason, uh, they develop some uh, severe depression and have some memory problems due to depression. I mean, I think that the evolution and the follow-up and a good baseline evaluation is key to, to answer that question. We see quite a few patients, and again, in, 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 it's kind of typical to some countries, that patients with autoimmune encephalitis after a few months of treatment uh, are being told, now you have functional neurological disease. Is there any uh, clear line or do you know of any research about functional neurological disease being on uh, a sort of a sequelae of autoimmune encephalitis or are two conditions totally separated or is there an intertwine between them in any way? I mean, uh, functional disorders are always uh, tough. Um, it's an exclusion diagnosis. Um, I don't think it they are more related to autoimmune encephalitis than to other uh, neurological disorders or psychiatric disorder. So, and I wouldn't even say in my own clinical experience that many patients with autoimmune encephalitis um, eventually develop functional disorders. That's not the case, at least in my own experience. It could be for some, but I, as it could be for some patients with, I don't know, epilepsy with from other uh, causes or with other neurological diseases. So I don't think differentiating between functional disorders or autoimmune encephalitis in the long term, it's a problem. It could be like at the initial episode, of course. And uh, this, um, yes, I have seen some patients, but then it's like, as I said, it's an exclusion diagnosis. So we have to perform all the investigations that are needed and rule out all the uh, possibilities. Um, one more question. Does the speed of recovery have any connection with relapses? Um, not that I'm aware of. I'm not sure that has been, or at least from the top of my head, I, I don't remember like any study um, providing any uh, any evidence of that. I would say that the faster a patient improves, usually the better it improves. Like uh, 
the the final outcome usually is better uh and usually also patients that go better are those that are less likely to develop relapses so um from a logical point of view i would say yes it makes sense but i don't think anyone has actually proved it Are there any, like uh, you mentioned um, MMS as a tool that a uh, clinician that ha doesn't have um, access to a big research facility or that's all the resources uh, that they have to evaluate uh, cognitive function. What would be a sort of a toolbox for a neurologist that I would say that to evaluate cognition the best I mean if um if the neurologist is working on a center in which um, um there is a team of neuropsychologists that are able to perform a comprehensive um neuropsychological testing such as an Adenbrook or others um, that are uh, similar. I would say that these comprehensive neuropsychological testing are the, mo the most appropriate ones, um, especially for young people, which um, of course, for young people and educated people, uh, for which of course, it's always much more difficult to actually uh, detect uh, slight or mild um, cognitive deficits. If you don't have um, a neuropsychological um, testing available in your center, that's much more difficult because I guess that if this is the case, you won't have either a lot of time to, <laughs> to perform those uh, neuropsychological testing yourself. And then I think that you can choose the test that you feel more comfortable with, either a MOCA or a mini mental, or even if for some people that are a little bit familiar with, um, for instance, the Adenbrook, the Adenbrook is the one that I was more familiar with. Uh, you can even like try to select some section of the Adenbrook testing that um, you can think that you are able to, to, um, to examine uh, during the consultation. But if you don't have actually like a neuropsychological uh, team with you, um, I guess, yeah, you don't have a lot of time either. It's uh, much more difficult, especially as I said, for young people or educated people, which, well, as we know, it's it's much more 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 difficult. Thank you so very much. Um, there, there are a lot of questions that I know from research that haven't been answered yet, and uh, it's an it's an ongoing and unlearning process for both the patients and the clinicians, and uh, also the researchers who 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 start the the. Uh, research projects on, on a certain uh, subject. And um, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts and your experience and your knowledge with us and bringing a bit more light on this uh, very hot and very sensitive uh, topic. Well, thank you for having me. Bye. Thank Bye. you again. Thank Bye. you.